Hello everyone, welcome to tutorial number 10 of our R tutorial series. Today we're going to be talking about planned contrasts, which is a very helpful form of data analysis, particularly for experimental designs. Um, but I'll be honest, it is confusing. I definitely was confused when I first heard about contrasts. And so what I'm trying to warn you is if at the end of this tutorial you're still kind of confused, don't worry. We all are a little bit the first time we learn about contrasts. We do have on our statistics lectures or in our statistics lectures, we have, we review this content specifically in our one-way independent ANOVA and our factorial ANOVA lectures. So I'm going to direct you to those lectures if you want more information. I will, in this particular R tutorial, talk about what contrasts are and how you build them because otherwise I'm definitely going to lose a lot of people um, if you don't already have a lot of experience with contrasts. So let's dive right into it. We've got a lot to cover and that's why I wanted to have a dedicated tutorial on this topic. Please download our R code and data sets from our GitHub. Make sure you change your directory to the location on your computer where you save those files and then finally as I've said previously, I want to make sure each new tutorial covers in detail only the new content and codes um, and functions rather than getting bogged down in things that we've already reviewed extensively in, in the past or in previous tutorials. So if you find that we're going through some code pretty quickly and you're kind of lost, I recommend you watch our earlier tutorials to figure out what we're doing. So let's start by loading the packages that we're going to be using. We're going to disable scientific notation and set our directory. And we're going to be playing with our alcohol and self-control study data. So we're going to import that Excel file and we need to factor our predictor variables for this experimental uh, study where we have two independent variables which have been manipulated. So sex of each participant, male, female, and um, alcohol intake. Uh, which has no alcohol and two versus four pints of beer. And for the sex condition, our reference category is set to female. And for the alcohol intake condition, the reference category is no alcohol. So for the first part of this tutorial, we're actually going to talk about this, what I call the seven rules for building contrast. But before we go into the rules, we actually need to talk just generally about what contrasts are. Some of this might be review for some people, but probably is totally new for a lot of people. So contrasts are weights similar to dummy codes, which remember when in our one-way independent ANOVA, which we ran, I showed you how a one-way independent ANOVA is just a multiple linear regression where the predictors are these dummy coded predictors. And R will automatically generate dummy codes. So I'm just running this function here the, to show you what the dummy codes it automatically generates. And because we know that none is the reference category for the... Uh, for this dummy coded predictor, what is what it's doing is comparing the two pint condition versus the no pint condition or the no alcohol condition. The other predictor is comparing um, no alcohol to the four pint condition. And these predictors are being, being fed into our linear model and we're going to get per parameter estimates for those predictors, in this case dummy codes. And those parameter estimates essentially reflect the specific hypotheses that are being tested. So in the case of this column, which is uh, the first predictor, it's testing the hypothesis that there's a significant difference between no alcohol and the two pint condition. And the second predictor is testing the hypothesis that there is a significant difference between the no alcohol condition and the four pint condition. Contrasts are basically doing the same thing as these dummy codes, but the big difference is that the values are different, meaning those zeros and ones it's a different kind of coding system, which is what makes a contrast a contrast and not what is technically called a dummy code. So contrasts are not dummy codes and dummy codes are contrasts, but they are similar in that they allow you to test particular types of hypotheses. Planned contrasts, though, the purpose of them is to reduce the, um, the risk of false positives by comparing groups that you hypothesize before doing your experiment um, you hypothesize that they would be different. So before you ran your clinical trial, you already had some hypotheses about what differences between groups you would see. And that allows you to control for, the false po for any false positive. Because remember, in our previous tutorial on the one-way independent ANOVA, 
if you had a significant F test, you'd then do a bunch of, you know, a ton of post hoc comparisons, which requires adjusting from the adjusting the p-values for multiple comparisons because the risk of a single false positive actually goes up exponentially with the more tests you do. But by saying, listen, out of all possible tests that we could do, we're only focusing on these relevant ones based off of our hypotheses. You don't have to correct for multiple comparisons and you're just focusing on that select subset, which you've already determined you would use before you did your experiment. So what do I mean by building contrast? So building contrast is essentially figuring out the values for these for your predictors that are going to be your contrasts. And the parameter estimates are then based off of those weights rather than rather than the dummy codes and just like the dummy codes, each parameter estimate then becomes a way to test a specific a priori hypothesis by contrasting the group means you hypothesized would be different. And here I'm just showing you a link to a helpful um, online resource which goes into more detail about how to do contrasts in R. So there's seven rules for building contrasts. So rule number one, uh, compare only two chunks of variation, and a chunk is just one or more levels of a factor, or in other words, uh, one or more groups, uh, per contrast. So if you Generally speaking, what is recommended is if you have a control group that your first contrast should really be comparing the control group with the experimental condition. And then any other further contrast uh, would, be, would be dependent on what your hypotheses are. So for us, what is our uh, experimental versus control condition? So our experimental condition is essentially giving people alcohol and our control condition is not giving people alcohol. So chunk one is gonna be our no alcohol condition and chunk two is the any alcohol condition, which is what we see here. So what would that actually look like in terms of the levels, levels of the factor or groups of the factor? So that would look like comparing the no pint condition or the no alcohol condition versus the average of the means of the two and four pint condition, right? So that's comparing no alcohol to any alcohol. And similarly for our other a priori hypothesis might be that, hey, there might be a dose response relationship between the level of impulsivity or, you know, the reduction in self-control depending on how much alcohol a person drinks. The more alcohol, the more impulsive they get. So your first chunk would be comparing the two pint condition versus the second chunk, which is the four pint condition. So that's really cool. We kind of understand now how chunks work. You, you pick out different uh, unique aspects of the variation in the outcome measure, and that allows you to test um, your a priori hypotheses. But what does that actually look like mathematically? Meaning, how do you actually assign the weights to test these two hypotheses we have? So first, at least in R, you actually have to look at the order of the levels of the factor. So if you apply the attributes function to the factor you're going to apply the contrast to, you notice that the order, it's in the first is no pints, second is two pints, third is four pints. So we know that the whatever value we put for the first, um, whatever is our first value is going to be the weight for the no pint condition. The second value will be the weight for the two pint condition. The third value will be the weight for the four pint condition. And that's exactly what we see here in the dummy codes. This is the weight for the no pint condition. This is the weight for the two pint condition, at least for this particular predictor. And this is the weight for the four pint condition for that predictor. And it's the same principle for contrast. So, um, yeah, each contrast uh, you must define according to the order of the level. So for contrast one, we're trying to compare no alcohol versus any alcohol. So the way you do that is you define a vector. And again, the first value is going to be the value of the no pint condition or the no alcohol condition. And then the second chunk is going to be of any alcohol. And I want you just to kind of ignore the fact that there's some are positive and some are negative numbers and that the one is a one and the other other two are 0.5. That's going to make sense very soon. I want you just to pay attention to the fact that we're picking out uh, different levels of, of the factor using these numbers uh, based off of the order with which they are arranged. So the first number is going to be the weight for the no pint condition and the second two numbers are the weights for the two and four pint conditions for contrast one. For contrast two, Notice that the 
because no alcohol is not included in contrast to, we actually don't have a weight for it. It's going to be zero. But for the two pint, its weight is going to have a unique value, negative one, and the weight for four pints is going to be one. So now let's go through the other rules, which will help explain why some have positive weights and some have negative weights, as well as why they have certain particular values like one and 0 0.5. So rule number two is that if a chunk has been singled out in a contrast, it can't be used in subsequent contrast, meaning its weight must be zero, unless it can be subdivided into smaller chunks of variation. So remember, in our first contrast, or I'll just look, we'll show here. In our first contrast, we were comparing two chunks of variation, the no alcohol versus al any alcohol. But in the no alcohol condition, we were picking out one particular mean, the, the no alcohol condition and it can't be further subdivided. So for our second contrast, it actually can't be included. So it is given a weight of zero. Whereas even though for chunk two, it had, um, we singled it out, but chunk two actually consisted of two further groups. And therefore we could subdivide that chunk into smaller chunks of variation, which is what we do in contrast number two. Rule number three, the chunks coded with positive weights are compared to chunks coded with negative weights. And that's exactly why for each contrast, we have one chunk with positive weights and the other chunk with negative weights. And it honestly does not matter which one gets positive or negative. It just doesn't matter. It's going to produce the same T statistics and P values regardless. Um, it's just going to change the sign of the parameter estimate, which ultimately doesn't really matter. Um, because the T statistics and P values stay the same. Rule number four, uh, chunks not in a contrast must be coded zero. So that's another way of saying rule number two. Rule number five, this is really important. The sum of all the weights in a contrast must be zero in order to make the contrast orthogonal. What do I mean by that? So let's look at contrast one. It's this vector of these three values. If we were to sum negative one plus 0.5 plus 0.5, that equals zero, meaning that this contrast is orthogonal. Again, if that doesn't mean anything to you, you're going to have to listen to our statistics lectures on one-way independent ANOVAs as well as the factorial ANOVA when we go into why orthogonal contrasts are important. For contrast two, similarly, zero plus negative one plus one equals zero. So that's an orthogonal contrast. Rule number six isn't a necessary rule, but if um, you want the the parameter estimates to equal the difference of means between the chunks being compared, then the weight for a chunk uh, must sum to one or negative one depending on the weights you assign to it, meaning the positively weighted chunk must, be, must sum to one and the negatively weighted chunk must sum to negative one. If you don't really care about the parameter estimates equaling the difference of means, then you can ignore rule six because the T statistics and P values will be the same regardless as long as you obey the other rules. So for contrast one, if we sum all the weights of chunk one, it's going to be negative one. This is chunk one. If we sum all the weights of chunk two, which is the 2.5s, um, that's going to equal one. Similarly, for contrast two, if we sum the weights for, uh, for chunk one, which is just one value, negative one, it equals negative one. And if we sum all the weights for chunk two, it'll equal one. And finally, rule seven, if you've built your contrast properly, the maximum number of contrasts you should have is K minus one, where K is the number of group means you had available to you. So for example, our predictor alcohol has three levels, so three group means, so we can only have two contrasts. Let's move on to, so on to how you actually do these um, planned contrast using the AOV4 function, and then subsequently we'll do the LM function. So there's four steps. First, you actually have to run the one-way ANOVA. So let's open this up so we can see it. We've already seen this result before. We have a significant F-test for alcohol, but we don't know what's driving that. So that's why we're doing our planned contrast. The second step, you actually get need to get the estimated marginal means. So I'm just going to scroll up. We're using the EM means function. So it's somewhat different from what we saw in the, in, um, the previous tutorial on the one-way independent ANOVA, because whereas we, we 
define the first argument as being the model, so that's the same. The second argument where we specify things, we don't actually specify pairwise comparisons. We just want to get the estimated marginal means. And because this is not a repeated measures ANOVA, we are, our model is going to be univariate rather than multivariate. So let's get the EMM, which is just our estimated marginal means. And then what we're going to do in step three is define a variable, which is going to be a list. And our variable is just called our contrast. And it's going to con contain the contrast, which we've defined above in part one. And a list, uh, the way you create a list is just with this simple function. I'm going to type in the console. It's just with that very simple function. And it's very similar then to how we define a vector with the C function. So those are our, um, our contrasts, which are based off of the seven rules. And then you can see the output of that. It's a list with two objects. And then step four, which is our last step, we actually are going to apply those contrasts to our estimated marginal means to test our hypotheses. And we're going to be using the contrast function. The first argument is our estimated marginal means. And then the second argument basically says, apply these contrasts to those estimated marginal means. And then we have the pipe function because we want to get the 95% confidence intervals around the parameter estimates. So let's open this up because it's going to be a little bit big and then run our planned contrasts. And there you go. So each row is our contrast. And what we notice is that for contrast number one, the any versus no alcohol condition, we have our parameter estimate, it's associated standard error, degrees of freedom, the upper and lower confidence intervals of that parameter estimate, the T statistic and its P value. So it's statistically significant, meaning that regardless of your sex, if you drink any amount of alcohol, you become more impulsive, which again, I think is consistent with lived experience. Uh, for those of you who have drunk alcohol, and then for our second contrast, we are comparing the two pint condition versus the four pint condition. We have the parameter estimate, the standard error, et cetera. And that is also statistically significant, meaning that people become even more impulsive compared to two pints if they drink four pints. And notice that what the parameter estimates are. So because we've uh, divine, defined contrasts that obey all seven rules, these parameter estimates actually measure or reflect, I mean, the difference of the means. So if we were to take the mean of the no alcohol condition and subtract the average of the two other conditions, we should get this value, which I'm going to show you. So what's the average? I'm going to type in the console. So the average of, and I have to do a vector here, of 64.7, which is the two pint mean and then 46.6 is 55.65 so if we take 63.8 which is the average of none or no alcohol minus 55.65 we get um oh sorry i did 64.8 63.8 my apologies we get uh 8.15 now it says one five and not one two because these are actually rounded numbers but if you were to actually get the other decimal places it would line up to eight point one, two. So that shows us that our contrast worked the way we wanted them. So we have a parameter estimate, which is just the difference of the two group means that we were comparing. Similarly, for the two pint condition versus four pint condition, if we take 64, 64.7 minus 46.6, that's 18.1, which is exactly this estimate. Now, what happens if you ignore rule six? Well, I just wanted to show you this because it showed be, to show you that actually rule six doesn't really matter unless you want the estimates to be the difference of the means. So here we are ignoring rule six. So notice for our first contrast, the negatively weighted cluster or negatively weighted chunk does not sum to one. Similarly, for the positively weighted chunk, it doesn't sum to one for both contrasts. But otherwise, all the other rules have been obeyed. What happens then in that situation is that we're going to get different parameter estimates, but everything else is going to be the same, meaning different, sorry, different parameter estimates and standard errors. But because the ratio of the parameter estimates to the standard errors is the same, the T statistic and P values are exactly the same. Notice. And the reason why the parameter estimates and standard errors are different is because we're using different weights. That is all. So things are weighted somewhat differently, but the overall ratio remains the same. And so the, the really important thing, which is the T statistic and P value, and therefore the overall take-home message, 
that there's a significant difference between our experimental and control relay, control conditions and a significant difference in terms of suggesting a dose response relationship, that story still remains the same, even though we've ignored rule six. And finally, for this tutorial, we'll finish off by showing you how to do planned contrast with the LM function. So it's also a four step process, but notice step two is somewhat different. So the, for step one, we define our contrast using the seven rules, but uh, we're now just using vectors to do so. So we have these two vectors named after our contrasts. And then step two um, is a little different. The reason why is because if you were to feed these contrasts directly into the LM function, you're actually not going to get parameter estimates that reflect the difference of means. So if you don't really care about that, then just honestly ignore step two. You don't have to do that. And I'm going to show you in a second what happens when you ignore step two. But if you want your parameter estimates to equal the difference of the means being compared, you need to get the inverse of the contrast matrix. What do I mean by that? So we're making a temporary variable called contrast temporary. And we're making, we're organizing these contrasts by rows using the rbind function. But in order to take the inverse of this matrix, we actually need to make it a square, meaning the number of rows need to equal the number of columns. At the moment, we have two rows because we have two contrasts and three columns because each has three um, means or three levels. So we're going to make this arbitrary variable called TMP or temporary just to make the matrix square. So I'll show you exactly what that looks like. So if you if we just run the temporary contrast, it's a, it's a square matrix. So we have three columns and three rows. The temporary is just a bunch of ones, and then we have our defined contrasts. And to actually take the inverse of a matrix, you apply the solve function, which basically flips the matrix. And then by taking the inverse, you get different values. So I'll show you what those are. So ignore this column because it's completely useless and serves no purpose other than just to make the matrix a square. But notice that the values of our contrasts have now changed. While they obey the principle of, of orthogonality, meaning if you sum all these numbers, it, it sums to zero, similarly for the other contrast, they, the positively weighted cluster or chunk no longer sums to um, one and the negatively weighted chunk no longer sums to negative one for both of those contrasts. But for whatever reason, if you shove those contrasts into the linear model, you're gonna get the parameter estimates which reflect the difference of the means. And that's why we do step two. So for the next line of code, we're just taking away this useless column by uh, using the square brackets and, after, and we're picking out the first column and doing minus one, which just removes it. So I'll show you, so now we have a, uh, essentially a, a matrix, but with two columns. And we're going to, in step three, link those contrasts, these custom contrasts that are the inverse of our defined contrasts. And we're gonna stick them into our, um, our, uh, our predictor. So if I just run contrast.alcohol, you'll see that right now they're just dummy coded. So we actually need to make them contrast by, by saying the contrast of Alcohol is these custom contrasts. And then I'll show you, um, we'll just confirm that that actually happened. So notice that the contrasts have changed to our custom contrasts. And then finally for step four, I'm gonna expand this so we can see everything. We're gonna run the linear model. And now that we, the contrasts are linked to the predictor, it'll automatically estimate the parameters of those contrasts. And what do you know? we have this multiple linear regression, uh, which is ultimately what a one-way ANOVA is, but our predictors, rather than being dummy-coded predictors, are actually our contrast-coded predictors testing our a priori hypothesized group differences. And our first predictor uh, shows the exact same uh, parameter estimate, which is just the unstandardized coefficient or the slope, so to speak, between the no alcohol and any alcohol condition. Uh, and we have the same T value and P value, which we saw above in the um, AOV4 fu um, function. And similarly, for our second contrast, we have a unstandardized coefficient, which is just the difference between the means of the two and four pine condition, which is the exact same we saw above. And it, of course, has the same T statistic and P value. If you don't believe me, let's just quickly scroll up. 
and um, there it is. It's the same estimate, the same T statistics, and same p-value, and same standard errors. So uh, the nice thing, though, because we used a linear model, we actually get all these other fit statistics. So you know the overall variation or variance that's explained by this model, which is about 34%, which is actually quite good. And that's how you do uh, plan contrast in the LM we using the LM function. You just have to use this fancy step two. What happens if you don't do step two? So this is the last part of this tutorial. So let's say, you know what, Aaron, I don't really care about having parameter estimates that actually equal the raw differences between the group means. And I will say, fair enough, that's fine. So if you really don't care about that, you can ignore um, rule number six and specifically rule step, uh, ignore step two. And what we do is we define our contrasts. We're going to make them columns. So we just stick our contrasts into uh, um, side by side next to each other as columns. So we'll just run the contrast. Here we have our columns. Um, they're still the same contrast that we've defined above, and we're going to stick them into our um, predictor variable using the same function we saw in step three. And then I'll show you the attributes so you can see that they, the contrasts are now changed uh, to their original contrast rather than the inverse, which we fed into the linear model previously. And then we run our linear model, and let's open this up. And what do you know? We have the different parameter estimates because, again, the weights are different um, and the standard errors are different, but the ratio between them is the same and therefore the t-statistics and p-values are the same. So the overall take-home message is that you, you're, the, they're testing the same hypothesis, but because the weights are different, the parameter estimates are different. But ultimately, both, um, regardless of whether you have parameter estimates which reflect the difference of the means or not, it'll still tell you whether or not, for instance, the experimental condition is significantly different from the control condition or whether or not there's a dose-response relationship in terms of impulsivity and the amount of alcohol someone consumes. Okay, that was a lot of content. I hope um, this was helpful and I hope I haven't lost too many of you. I will admit it is a confusing topic. So if you do feel somewhat confused, um, don't worry, you're not alone. Uh, I do encourage you to look at our statistics lecture, and probably it might be helpful to watch this lecture, this tutorial again, uh, to help you better understand how what contrasts are and how you use them in R. In the meantime, I'm very thankful uh, for the fact that you watch these tutorials. I do hope they're helpful, and uh, until next time, take care. Bye.